Welcome to the REI Hacker Podcast, where we unlock the secrets of real estate success. Join us as we dive into the journeys of top investors, mentors, and industry experts. Learn from their experiences and navigate the highs and lows of the investing world. And now, let's hand it off to our host, Benson Juarez. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today for this edition of the podcast. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, we have uh, an expert with us. His name is Don Thornton. Uh, he is the founder of uh, Wealth, uh, Wealth Legacy Partners. Um, they are consultants. They help out with uh, asset protection. And also, they're experts in uh, an impending doom that is on the horizon for many real estate investors and business owners. Um, having to do with the uh, Corporate Transparency Act, something that is kind of um, been people have been talking about a little bit here and there, Don, um, but it is turning out to be potentially a much larger problem than I think a lot of people are anticipating. So thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Very cool. Well, tell us a little bit about you know you and your background and how did you come into this world of asset protection and how the heck did you become an expert in the Corporate Transparency Act? Well, I kind of fell into it like I do most things in my life. Uh, you know, my journey started, my adult journey started with my full intention of becoming a diplomat, a Slavic language expert, State Department employee. Hmm. I went over to the Soviet Union back in the late 80s to be a, uh, you know, to get it uh, as a contractor, mostly just I wanted to be there to get, become fluent in language. And just so happened that the Soviet Union fell at the time my contract was ending, and I stayed and ended up staying until the early 2000s. Uh, ironically enough, I got married, I have kids and so forth who are still over there, but um, I stayed there until there was no way to keep making a nice living over there. And so I came back and my sister was in Orlando and I said, you know what? I've had enough being an employee. I want to have my own business. And, and in Florida, the way to make real money was real estate. And mm. so I decided that I was going to become a real estate investor. And I took a, two years of just arduous searching and angst and, and almost starving, trying to figure out what I wanted until I decided that short sales were the best way to do it and jumped into that, was successful, flipped. I flipped over 3,500 short sales in my time. Wow. and. How I got to this was I got tired of paying so much in taxes and I got tired of carrying, you know, five plus million dollars of liability insurance because here in Florida, any, any, you know, if a deal goes bad for whatever reason, the bank says no, they you know, that everybody wants to sue. And so I just kept more and more liability insurance and I finally realized this was just absolutely insane. And I found out about a, um, you know, about a trust that would allow me to get as much as close to hundred percent lawsuit proof asset protection as I could get. And there was some tax advantages as well, but it just so happened that I stumbled onto the way for me to exempt myself and my company from the corporate transparency act. So I felt like there's mm -hmm. too much cosmic stuff going on here that I needed to share that. And I just became an expert on my own. And then I started working with some attorneys out of Houston and um, now I'm one of their master distributors and 95% of what I do now is educating people, especially in real estate, about what's coming down next year. And most people don't know about it. And so it's almost like my mission to get this mm -hmm. out there and tell you, you don't want to be inside that, that database they're creating. And we have a legal way to exempt yourself and your business from doing so. So before we get too nerdy here with Right. the the act itself um what are the implications here just so real estate investors anybody who owns an llc or has an llc for you know asset protection or um you know anonymity tax benefits mm -hmm. why is it so important that people understand what's coming down the pipe the challenge that i'm having with a lot of people is that they think this law is just another piece of paperwork you got to put in every year. And I am shocked that attorneys and CPAs are not understanding or unwilling to say about what the implications are of what this law is going to mean 
for anybody that owns a, any kind of a corporation or an LLC. Uh, there is, is a fundamental change in how we own things and what our privacy is. And, you know, it, I'll just say this one thing. Whenever you have a new government government uh, program, a government law, a, a law and a um, enforcement, and they put the the financial crimes enforcement network that specializes in money laundering to administrate it. That's when you got to start paying some attention to it quickly. So that's the FinCEN, right? So FinCEN, yes, financial crimes and enforcement network. Mm -hmm. This is like. Um, a, a police arm of, or maybe it's like the FBI of the government, but for specific, they go after crimes. money laundering, <laughs> money laundering, money okay. laundering. Yes. So why are they thinking that all these people are, are money laundering? Is, is it just, there's, that's a, a trend that's happening or is this just another way for them to control the American people? Uh, it's yes. And yes. Uh, <laughs> like a lot of things the government does, they're, they try to be noble with it. With Like in this case, their justification is they want to root out money laundering, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and terrorism funding. And they feel like that the majority of shell companies, holding companies, LLCs, especially the ones that don't have many members, which hello – we have that's what we do as real estate investors. They feel like that's where most of this stuff is happening. So the government, especially the federal government, as we know, they tend to have the um, the law enforcement method of get a sledgehammer and kill that fly, or a bull in a china shop, where mm -hmm. they're they're going to cause so much collateral damage, and that's what no one is talking about apparently except me. Because and, and the attorneys I work with, because we see it and we know exactly what's coming, and it's going to be much worse than anybody thinks. So I, I heard somebody talking about this, and then I was talking with a lender, and they're like, "Well, it, you don't have to really worry about it. Like, if you're not breaking any laws or any rules, you know, it, there's going to be some transparency, and the IRS will know who the individuals are that are associated with a particular LLC, but the regular public won't. So that's so it's no big deal." Like, what's your perspective on that explanation of the law? Well, it's very naive, number one, and I'll tell you why. This is the first time ever that in the history of our country that there is a federal database that's being created that is forcing, you know, uh, small business owners, investors to put all of their information into this database. Never had that before at all, ever. So now you may say, yeah, you're right. It, theoretically, if you've done nothing wrong, you should be okay. But this is a whole different thing here. When you get into this law, you see there are landmines that are laid out there for all of us. And you can be 100% clean, or you think you're 100% clean, and still suffer some very bad collateral damage. Let me just give you a quick overview of what this is. They believe that if you if they can root out who has what they call a beneficial ownership in any kind of an entity, LLC or corporation, that that will bring people out of the shadows and put them in this database where they can be watched and where they can be examined and then if they're, you know, doing something illegal, root them out. But the their interpretation or their requirements of who an owner is, who a beneficial owner is, is absurd. And it's going mm -hmm. to lead to a lot of problems. I'll give you an example. I have an S Corp. So, which I'm, of course, I'm getting rid of it soon before the law uh, comes into, into uh, effect. But nevertheless, right now, there's still an S Corp. Um, so, when I reg if I when I register my S Corp or register anything, so the person that d files the paperwork according to the Corporate Transparency Act is now an is now a beneficial owner of my company. You know, all that person does is file paper. The supervisor 
of that person is all con is also considered a beneficial owner in my company. I could have, you know, so I have a, I'm the president of my company. I have a hundred percent of the stock. So I am the sole owner of my, pro of my company. If I had a CFO, if I had a, you know, a COO or any senior management, they now consider that those people to be a beneficial owner of my company. Right. There is a very murky um, definition of who else they think can be a beneficial owner of my company. It can be somebody who exercises significant control. They don't specify what that is. There's also something that says if there is uh, someone who has influence on my company, they are considered a beneficial owner. Okay, so you can see how we're getting a little bit away from from you know true transparency here, and so and you can see how that's going to be very difficult for me to figure out as an owner. What am I? Who am I supposed to report as an owner of my company? And second of all, the the reporting requirements are very strict, and there are some very draconian fines, daily fines, and criminal charges if you don't do everything correctly so mm -hmm. imagine this scenario so you've got a company and you have someone an employee let's just i don't want to sound you know sexist here but let's just say you know it's a young woman and uh, she is the person that files the reports so now she's considered an owner and her supervisor is considered an owner all right, so you have you have you have to she has to provide all this information, name at her personal address, phone number, email, social security, date of birth, a whole packet of stuff, her driver's license, a copy, a photocopy of her driver's license, all this stuff, and everybody involved. How you you as a business owner, you have to get all this information and you have to send it out. Okay. Now, let's say, for example, that she gets married and she's a traditional woman and she wants to take her husband's name. Okay, if if you don't keep track of what's happening in her life and you don't know that she she got married and she she changed her name or put a hyphen on her name, even, you have 30 days to respond to that. I mean, to, to update that. If you don't, you are not in compliance. And they can wow. start finding you $500 a day retroactively if you don't do that, okay? So you can just see from just from that description alone how much more of a bureaucratic nightmare that's going to be for you to keep track of all these different people and what happens if they move. They change their personal address, their personal residential address, and they don't update you, they don't tell you that. You, as the business owner, are non-compliant with this law. Wow. Okay. Does this <laughs> give them any rights? So can somebody now say, well, I'm in the eyes of the IRS, I'm considered a beneficial owner of your company. Right. I am due dividends or I'm due extra pay or, you know, I you're selling the company. So I want my share. Like, is that a potential risk? That is a potential risk. They don't. That's what we're talking about here is that there's so much that's unclear. And we're opening up a Pandora's box with this law that is going, the repercussions are going to be so much more profound than we even think about. And I'm just looking at them. And that's a good point you raised there because I hadn't really even thought about that part of it. But yes, because now you're in this whole murky thing. Before we knew, for example, we knew for 100%. I have an S Corp. I have 100% of the, 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 uh, the uh, stock. It's my company. Not anymore. I have other beneficial owners, and you're right. If they if they're if they're forced to report, does that not mean they, need, they deserve compensation? Do they can they not go after an ownership stake or ownership uh, compensation? You're right, hundred percent. I was just thinking on the on the civil and criminal penalty side. I mean, this but is the first thing that came to my mind was that yeah. they now can make a claim mm -hmm. to the ownership of the company itself and get financially compensated. Right. Um, that's scary to me. That is, that is yeah crazy. There's they, a lot of companies, 
that you know that have like the where they pay for a registered agent in mm -hmm. these other states right and these are just random companies right that right. the registered agent there so those companies now are going to have f beneficial interest or beneficial ownership, ownership in yeah. all of those companies just out of the gates as soon as 2024 hits mm -hmm. yeah well, I mean, you have existing companies have until the end of the end of 2024, but yes, that's, that's what's coming. Are you, you if you form anything new, exactly hundred percent. So mm -hmm. it's that person. Think about the nightmare of those companies. So the, whoever is the person that physically files the, files the uh, applications and the registrations and that supervisor, if they do what 50 for 50 clients are going to have to do, they have to report as, as a beneficial owner for those 50 people and then those those 50 uh, business owners are going to have to keep track of those people to make sure they don't they don't move or they haven't gotten married and change your name otherwise they're in, in not in compliance at all and they can start getting fined and have possible criminal charges for that and so is the is all the onus on the business owner or is there yes. any fines they can give to the registered agent as well no no that's the thing it's the owner the actual owner there's the government saying that all these people are beneficial owners, but you are solely responsible. Oh my God. Yeah. That is scary. That is very so, scary. So that's some of the, uh, the implications and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the things that people have to worry about, like, like let's get clear about what the law is itself. So what mm -hmm. is this law and what is it, what is required of business owners? Business owners have, have to report and update who is a beneficial owner of their company. Right. So okay. you have, to, and they don't have the, they don't have it set up yet. Cause it's, you know, they're, they're not ready. They're not ready yet at all, but you're going to have to set the government's not, the the government's not ready yet. Yeah. It's not the IRS it's FinCEN. So it's FinCEN. They're not ready yet. Okay. So they, okay, let me just get another, another Semi nightmare scenario. They the language in the law talks about whether you are willfully non compliant with the law or not. Willfully non compliant means you're going to either get a get fined or b they're going to have criminal charges against you. But it's very unclear as of yet what that means. So here's a scenario that I like to talk about. Let's say, for example, that. Um, you submit everything to as far to your best of knowledge that you're you're on in compliance. So you send it all out on January 31st. But if you think about there are tens of millions of LLCs alone in this country, you right. think they're not going to get overwhelmed? What if it takes them 90 days to it take them years? And, years. It can, years. Come, yeah, and come back and say, hey, you are uh you made a mistake. So oh, and we're going to retroactively retroactively five hundred dollars a day, fine. Oh okay, so if if you're lucky and they tell you about it, so so people say, well, you got they're going to give you ninety days to correct it, but you see, if you read the law, it's very unclear about what they 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 refer to ninety days as a safe harbor, but you read the law and it it indicates. That their thinking is if you self-report, you know, that you made a mistake, they'll give you 90 days. But if they have to tell you, does that mean you're not in safe harbor? Well, it's very unclear. It's mm. left to them to decide if that's safe harbor, if, 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 if it was willful noncompliance or not. And that that's just the beginning. Moving forward, like I said, if somebody has a change in their life, address change, name change, and you're not aware of that, and this goes forward, and then they they find out something happened there, and then you're not in compliance. Minimum is five hundred dollars a day retroactive fines from when you submitted the, the erroneous report. And how long does it take them to figure it out? And then, right. and then, and then, what what could also happen is they figure, well, you know, if you're willfully non-compliant. They can charge you with that. And that is, these are money laundering statutes. Okay. So they can, they can charge you $10,000 fine per violation or two years in prison per violation. But that, that's not the, um, that's not the horror of it. 
there's it gets even worse. And, and I've been accused of being a doomsdayer, but I'm telling you, it's you get into this stuff, you see this could very easily happen. And it probably will happen. Um, they are making banks and financial institutions the eyes and ears, and in some ways the enforcement net uh, authorities for this for this law. So I had a conversation about about a month or so ago with a very high exec at, at Citibank. And I was just chit-chatting with him. And I said, hey, have, have you heard about the Corporate Transparency Act? He said, Well, yeah, of course. We had we had Treasury Department agents in our, you know, in our in our uh, facilities for a couple of weeks that were training our staff on what to look for uh, on transactions, suspicious, unusual, nefarious, things like that. And so I said, So what are they gonna do? And he says, Well. Before, because I mean, I used to have my uh, a mortgage license, and I know all about suspicious activity reports, SAR reports, and so on and so forth. And you know, you would send them out, and you'd file them and forget them about them. He says, "No, they are being instructed to file the SAR report and then freeze the account immediately." Okay. Wow. Before it was SAR, send it off, and then the FBI would decide about that. Now the banks have been given leeway permission just to freeze to freeze first and ask questions later and then that triggers an investigation and here's the statistic that i thought was really interesting that the law firm told me we had a special training about this and they said that only one percent of assets and money that were have been seized by the government are ever returned and the reason why is that they go in and they'll do an they'll do an investigation, like with a fine tooth comb, and this goes back to your earlier question about whether hey you know if you're if you're a law body what do you have to worry about? Well, no one's hundred percent perfect. If you have a missing form, you didn't check the right box, or something like that, they'll go in there and they'll look for something and they'll hang their hat on that and say, well, okay, you don't have to close your business down, but you're not, we're not going to release the funds back to you because of this, 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 and this. So, and, and the question I always ask people is how can you defend yourself if your money's frozen? How can you hire an attorney if you don't have any money available to you because it's frozen? I talked to a guy, in fact, I'm going to have him on my podcast tomorrow. He, he has an, he has an investment uh, business and they came in and shut him down. And he says, I can't get anyone to talk to me. I, he says, I went from a million over a million dollars last year. To I'm I'm uh, I'm giving I'm selling plasma to, to help keep our stuff going. He says, I don't know what to do. No one will talk to me. I don't have any money to defend myself. You know. And so this is even before the law is put into before, effect. Yes, this is something yes. different. There was some sort of suspicious activity that the someone bank... filed a suspicious activity report. Yeah. But you see, the banks are becoming more bold about this because they've been emboldened by the government. And they've been they've been being trained a lot this entire year about you know what what they're going to do and, and freeze. And I asked this guy at City, I said, "How many do you think they're going to start freezing?" And he goes, "Thousands a month." He says it's coming thousands a month, and then it's just so you're so ba and so. I moved all of my accounts to you know I, I'm I'm getting rid of my my S corporation I I work through I'm going to work through a, a, a what we call a contract law business trust because it's exempt from from being in in the corporate transparency act and so I was setting up like four accounts with uh, with my banker and I was just chit chatting with him and I said um, let me ask you this. I said so I'm I'm exempt went through the whole thing he says yeah you're exempt hundred percent and I said so does that mean that your employees are not going to be looking and our said, no, we're not, we're not looking at the exempt companies. We're only mm -hmm. looking at the ones that are inside that fishbowl of a database that is being created. Which is 99% of all businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the bigger, the bigger fish are okay. I mean, if you have a business that, that has gross receipts of $5 million or more, and you have 20 full-time U.S.-based employees that are in a brick and mortar company, you can't be remote, then you're exempt. Banks are exempt. Accountants, insurance is like 24 different exempt categories. Mm -hmm. But just for shorthand, if you got if they got bailed out in 2008, they're exempt from this too, right? Of course right. they are. Right. So uh, but 
Yeah, but the the rest of us slobs that you know that don't have those kinds of uh, revenue and we don't have those kinds of uh, employees, then yeah, we're stuck unless you exempt yourself. And you know, a lot of that's why that's kind of what I'm what, what I'm doing here is, is trying to tell people there is one way to exempt yourself. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you're going to go through all this stuff, and it's a scary thing because you've got. Um, you got the banks are now going to be looking over your shoulder. There's, there's a uh, immense amount of pressure on them to err on the side of caution and, and, and go DEFCON 1 immediately. Then you've got the government that is going to go in and start investigating. And I'm sorry, like I said, they're going to find something to make sure you keep them. They're going to keep that money. And so the they meantime, could just be doing this as just a, a way of doing a, it's a money grab. Right. How yes. can we generate more? Yes. More fees. How mm-hmm. can we generate more revenue? Yep. Without increasing taxes on people because, oh my God, the, the tax rates are high or whatever. Right. And so like people go and they, they choose presidents and they, they uh, choose politicians based off of, you know, are they going to help them out financially potentially? And so they can say, oh, well, we didn't raise taxes, but right. they are essentially raising taxes by creating all this new revenue that's coming in. It's just not tax like it would normally be taxed yes right and for, for yes and from a real estate point of view you think about all those people that are buy and hold investors or they're subject to investors and they're using llcs to put their properties into and a lot of them you know one of the some of the more popular asset protection and, and, and anonymity based investments are in llcs in wyoming or delaware right. or nevada okay they're they're all going to have to be thrown into this thing. And so, you know, I, people naively say, well, the government has all information already. It's like, well, no, they don't. They haven't because these, these shell companies, these, these LLCs, these holding companies that in the, these more intricate asset protection and, and tax reduction strategies have worked for a long time. That's one of the reasons why they're going after them, right? Because they mm-hmm. work too well. So now everything's going to be dragged out. And so they're going to have AI that's going to analyze everything. And they're going to say, you underpaid your taxes because now we see all of this other stuff that we didn't see before, but now we can see it because we got this, we've dragged it all into this one fishbowl of a database. AI is going to look at everything. They're going to say, you underpaid your taxes. You underpaid your taxes pay up, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's the financial institution that's going to be compensated in any way. Like, or is there going to be some sort of an incentive for them to like seize accounts? Like, okay, you guys, yes. you seize yes. this account, you get to keep 5% of it. Anything like that? 5%. Uh, according to the law, uh, when a person's found guilty, uh, the, the financial institution gets 30 to 35% of the take. Really? Yes. Well, no wonder they're so on board with this. This is like another huge revenue, potential revenue source for them. They're going to be going through everyone's accounts with a fine tooth comb and now they've yeah. got the government behind them yeah this is like i mean it, it's, it sounds like something the mob would do it's, it's very crazy simple, right it's, it's ironic right they're going after the mob quote unquote you know organized crime and they're using very similar methods which is which is just shockingly uh terrifying in in, in a lot of ways um i don't know if you know or not but you know, the the U.S. got its inspiration from the Corporate Transparency Act from the United Kingdom. Hmm. The, the, the U.K. has their own law, and it's been in effect for longer than, than ours is. I mean, ours is just starting. They've had it for a while. But I read a statistic, a statistic about their experience. In within three years of their CTA taking effect, the amount of foreign investment in UK real estate dropped by 70%. Hmm. Because a lot of foreign buyers didn't want, they didn't, they were losing their anonymity and they're proud of it over there. I'm thinking to myself here in Florida, our economy, the backbone of our economy is real estate. And so many foreign investors are here. What's going to happen to our, you know, our overall economy, much less the state of Florida economy when foreign buyers stop buying. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to have everything out there. Because, by the way, if you're a foreign buyer, 
you had to provide FinCEN with a photocopy of your passport. You know, you can't, wow. you can't, you can't buy it through LLCs anymore. Not, and you, I mean, you can, but you're going to have to report. Right. Right. And that's what, what a lot of people will do, right? They're going to just fall in a line and be like, okay, this is just one more thing that we have to yeah. do. And mm -hmm. obviously you see that there's, there's challenges there. There's financial challenges yeah. and there's, they're going to lose some anonymity, but you've potentially found a way working with this, this law firm to, mm -hmm. for an alternative solution. Mm -hmm. and, and what is that? Well, there are very, there's one loophole to this. Okay. And one. it all comes down to is one. Well, there's two. You can be a sole proprietor mm -hmm. and pay the highest tax rate and have zero, li you know, have a complete liability. Right. Or you can do one other thing. In, <clears throat> in the government's own document that goes through this, this entire horror show of a law, they give a flow chart of whether you are a reporting company or not. And so it stops up, starts up here and says, are you a corporation? If it's yes, over here is report. You got to report. Second one down is, are you an LLC? Yes, over here, got to report. And here's the key one right here in the bottom. It says, was your company created by the filing of a document with a secretary of state of any state or similar department or from any state or in any reservation? If it says yes, you're over here, you got to report. But if it says no, if you say no, not reportable, it's not a reporting company. Okay. So our trust, our contract law, business trust, and personal trusts are not required to register with any state. I have two trusts. I have a, a business trust that I run my active business revenue through, and I have my uh, personal trust where I have all my real estate, all my real estate investing, and what I'm doing you know, with the, uh, with the attorneys. So none of those are are registered with any any uh, any any, any uh, department state or department division of corporations in, in uh, Florida can't find them because it's a federal all it has to do is get registered with as an EIN number with the with the IRS and that's it and just files a tax return but it's not required to register with the federal I mean with the uh, state government mm -hmm. or corporations so therefore I can run my business where I can do my real estate investing and it's in an exempt entity. So I'm free from that. I don't have to worry about that. And that's what we're telling people. Look, there's one loophole. This is the one. Right. You can use it. So this particular trust structure or entity type, mm -hmm. is it different than other trusts that yes. are out there? Yes. Um, so um, there's a lots of other trusts that people form land trusts and mm -hmm. there's, you know, personal, you know, liability trusts and there's, mm -hmm. um, you know, what do they call those? There's another you know, trust and I've got some trust trusts too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so those trusts wouldn't allow me to not, no. to not report. I would have to report with those right. even if they're not, they weren't established through a, the secretary of state or any sort of well, yeah, lo local they filing. Owe Here's the here's the way uh here's the the cheat sheet. If the trust owes its creation to any act of any legislature, then it is what they call a statutory law trust, and it is pulled into CTA. You can't do anything about that. Whereas our trust, that's what we call them a contract law trust, is because they owe their existence to the Constitution, which is Article One, Section Ten which states that no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. As long as a contract is not illegal, then any party, two parties can have a contract that it sets out the terms and, and compensation and so on and so forth. Our contract law trust is at its core, a contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it, it is, um, you know, a trust is, it's it's uh, where you have a trustee that's doing something, you know, providing a service or doing something on behalf of beneficiaries, and and it has its own language and so on and so forth. That is all a private 
agreement between the parties. And right. as long as it's not illegal, if it's not doing illegal things, it has, we still, thank God, we still have the right to contract in this in this country. And so therefore, um, because it was it is not created from an act of a legislature, then like an LLC, the very first LLC, the law for an LLC was in was in the state of New York in 1811. Okay, so it got it was birthed in by the state of of New York. So there you go. It, it's it, that's why it's included. Corporations, same thing. Ours mm -hmm. is not. And so the the key thing is, and I invite anybody to go to the you know FinCEN or just Google FinCEN and then B capital B capital O capital I is beneficial owner instructions. They have a seventy page. PDF. You can go there. You'll see the flowchart. It's right there. And it says, if it wasn't created by and not and not and doesn't have to file annual reports and all that kind of stuff that you have as a statutory law entity, then it is exempt from this. It's not a reporting company. So why would the government leave that loophole open if they if the goal is to get people to report and to basically mm -hmm. become part of this database and to get all the fees and fines and seize mm -hmm. assets. Why even leave that loophole open? Well, they would have had to regulate every single private contract in this country for them to do that. Because this is a this is a private contract. These these trusts, they would mm -hmm. have had to go in and create legislation to do so. And especially when you consider that they snuck this this uh, piece of legislation through a, a defense appropriations bill in two thousand twenty one. They weren't looking for debate about all this stuff. No, you know, no, so they weren't. I think they, I think they felt like that that the problem is is inside corporations, uh, small corporations, and in LLCs, and that's who they were targeting. And we can only be thankful that uh, you know this was left, and it is, and and it's for not going to be well. Yeah, but they're going to have to file a. They're going to have to have a new law to that. They're going to have to go. It's going to have to go through Congress and in the White House. Right. Uh, they, they just can't just say, OK, boom, that's it. I mean, this is the well, law. The law was created with this. These are the terms and so on and so forth. They just can't willy nilly say, oh, by the way, you know, uh, let's do, you know, give me a give me a second chance to, to check. No. And I my feeling is that in the next few years, when people start to feel what's happening, what's going to what's going to start happening then there's going to be an out there's going to be a national wave of outrage about this and they're not going to be able to slip it through in a defense appropriations bill like they did you know whatever change yeah. you know, there's gonna be well, a whole, i was going to say like they did it before they went and yeah. changed the law and they you know did the whole legislative process to get this thing through so they could do it again right and they could you but, know they could you know, absolutely do it and so there's a, i feel like there's a window here I do too. And that's what I'm saying is I'm a, that's why, you know, the people that can do this and you have, a, you have a window, you have until the end of next year to register. So if you, you know, see the wisdom in doing this and you take action and we can certainly help you with that, then you're going to be okay. And you can, uh, but you're going to have to close down that business, whatever business you have, you're gonna have to close it, close it down. Now on real estate investors, Let's say, let's say that okay, I was I was talking to a, a very successful investor recently. He's got 200 uh individual properties that he rents out. He's got 200 LLCs in Wyoming. Okay. So what he's gonna have to do is he's gonna he's gonna have to deed those over to his personal trust that we're gonna provide for him and do a quick claim deed, you know, a quick claim deed and then a bill of sale to get them over into this trust. And then Every single LLC has got to be closed down, dissolved, dissolved. You cannot have any connection anymore. They have to be severed. If you want to not, you don't want to get dragged into the corporate transparency act. Right. And there's going to be a financial. Sure. I don't know what you call it, but um, the paperwork for like, mm -hmm. cause they still have to pay the taxes on those and then shut them down properly. And then for these new trusts, they're going to have beef. There's gonna be a bunch of, you know, fees, to go out and form these new entities and then go yeah. and file yeah. EINs and get bank accounts. And, you know, yeah, I mean, God. listen, I, I wish I could make it, you know, and say, you know, sing Kumbaya and say, no, there's going to be, there's going to be uh, an investment you have to make. And you just have to weigh it. What's better. 
you know right i mean uh <laughs> i mean just anybody think of, go back to the beginning when we talking about it, as far as you know the government says that anybody who has significant influence on my business is considered a beneficial owner of my company is that a mentor could a mentor be classified by the government as someone who has influence on my company if i pay a coach right coach gives me i you know advice on how to do something could that be considered construed as a beneficial ownership in my company could they use that as a way to justify freezing my accounts or seizing my assets see and, and i'm i'm always come back to fincen the financial crimes enforcement network was specifically chosen to oversee this law which means that the criminal charges, the criminal the, um, consequences are money laundering consequences. And those money laundering statutes are very draconian. And people really aren't understanding that. And so in money laundering, you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And like I said, what, what do they do? They cut the money off and you can't defend yourself. Right. And, and that's, and people say, oh, you're just, being a doomsday or it's like i mean <laughs> you learn about this stuff and, and you see how subjective it is and how they could easily do whatever they want to get what they want and they want to they 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 think that that ultimately anybody who uses these llcs and these holding companies and shell companies they think that that we're money launderers the, otherwise they wouldn't go after us and they wouldn't put fence right. at the head of it is this at all related to the IRS hiring 90,000 tax people? It's all part of it. It's I mean, all part of it. It's all yeah. part of it. It's not just the IRS. I mean, they're also using that money to to uh, increase FinCEN's capabilities. But yes, 100%. Was that all part of the same bill? No, no. It was the, the, um, the IRS was funded by the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was passed mm. a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah, that's where all the billions came for the IRS and for FinCEN. But they had to have the legislation in place to be able to enforce it. And that's what the corporate transparency was. They got the they got the they got the law in first, and then the the next step was to get the funding for it, which they did. Right. Again, under the cover of reducing inflation. They got Is there one the side of the aisle pushing no. this harder than the other? No, it was it was bipartisan. They started they started uh, working towards uh, getting a corporate transparency act filed as early as 2017 during the Trump administration. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and and there was co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican. You know, I know that we're so polarized in this country that one side's just willing to say stick it to Biden or stick it to Trump, and it, it, a plague on both their houses. Okay, right. It was signed by Biden. Uh, one of the first, you know, in 2021, but it was already, it was already set and it was all done during the Trump administration. But again, I'd love you know, to blame one side or the other, but they both supported it. They both. Oh did. yeah. It's like, they can't agree on anything, but this, yeah, that yeah. must, that, that's gotta be some red flags right there. Like they can't agree on anything. They'll, they'll shut the government down for all these other reasons, but this is the thing they agreed on, or at least one of the things. Yeah. Well, if you it's think about it, I mean, comical. The Republicans, I mean, look at 2028. I'm gonna start 28, 2008, right? The big boys got bailed out. And, and not, not just Republicans. I mean, Obama, of course, as well. Bush started, Republicans, I mean, the Democrats continued it. So, but the bailouts were for big business. Both sides, both sides of the aisle are owned by big business, by big corporations. Mm -hmm. And that's why none of them are involved in this at all. Right. They're exempt, you know. So, uh, and that was what five, you said $5 million in revenue and at five, least 20 five million in a brick and mortar five, location. Over 5 million in gross receipts and at least 20 or more employees in a brick and mortar type situation. You can't be remote. And it had, and the car, it has to, you know, it, the entity that you run your business in has to have been created by the filing of a document in a secretary of state of one of the 50 states in the union. Right. Those are the, those are, those are the, the core requirements. So are there any percentages out there on, on how many businesses this is going to affect? Like the, the percentage of all the companies out there, anybody like 
calculating or estimating that? Well, I know that there's around 36 million LLCs right now in this country. And of course, that wow. doesn't mean 36 different, 36 million companies because there's a lot of us that, you know, real estate especially, we use those uh, right. LLCs for asset protection, but that's a lot. And then again, corporations as well, S Corp or C Corp, they're out there too. They're reporting companies. So it's a huge swath. And what's what's scary about this from a macroeconomic point of view is that, you know, what is it, 80% or more of the jobs that are created in this country are created by small business. And how is this mm-hmm. going to negatively affect our, our economy? I'm already worried about the real estate side, you know, um, really worried about that. That, that that's that completely dis, disincentivizes things. I mean, here's an example. Okay, this is why people. I'm gonna keep it real estate. That's what I'm in. But let's say that you're a you're a flipper, and I flipped a ton of houses. So let's say that my average flips make me fifteen to twenty five thousand. I'm doing my job or whatever. AI is watching. The banks are watching. Everybody's watching. Then all of a sudden, I get a big score. I get one for $80,000. Suspicious. Mm-hmm. Frozen. Suspicious Sorry. activity report. Yep. Okay. Close down the account, slam it down. Because it's it's out of the ordinary, right? That's right. what you're looking for. So you can have a big score, and then next thing you know, they close Yeah, and you could have easily explained that big hit on the on the flip yep. but it's by that time it's too late your money's already yes. frozen that's the stuff that's going to start happening wow yes so so when people say oh if you're clean it's no big deal that they're being naive or they're they're doing a disservice to their to their fiduciary clients if it, i'm talking about attorneys and, and uh cpas because they're not talking about that right and that's so what's going to this- start happening do you see a lot of lawsuits coming down like where yeah businesses are going to be suing the government or banks yes, I think, because I think this, or are they point... getting some sort of um, insulation well... <laughs> lawsuits they left out one group that normally makes sure that it's it's butt is covered every single time um they they did not exempt attorneys mm. attorneys have to register with the corporate transparency act so i suspect that uh, you know, a lot of them are you know they're going to be incentivized to bring suit. I hope so. I certainly do. Now yeah. they have the incentive, right? Yeah, it's just hard. It's just hard to go against the federal government. You know, I mean, you don't have the resources like they do. But um, I think I think that's going to happen. I think that I think that there's when when people start to see it and feel the pain, and it may be another couple of years because remember, existing companies have until the end of 2024. So they're not going to really start feeling it until 25 and 26 and 27. So, you know, it's going to take time for it to go to work its way through, but you got to be able to survive in the meantime. Yeah. Before any change happens. And we all hope that happens. But until then, you got to deal with the new reality, which starts on January 1st, 2024. So what do you recommend that people do right now? Like, do they go and, and meet with their their accountants, their attorneys, like start to get advice on the best ways to approach this. Um, I would say reach out to me because I'll give you the, I'll give you the real poop on it. <laughs> but on what, uh, what's coming down as you, as you've seen yourself, they're mm-hmm. not taking it seriously yet. No, they're not. And they don't have the resources. They're they're They are very educated and experts on what they know. And they know LLCs, corporations, typical accounting that they they that that's the world that we live in well you have to go outside that box to get the loophole which is contract law and contract law trusts to run your business through they're not going to have a clue about that no most you know, most attorneys don't know about that and i want to be clear with everybody too because I, I remember seeing this but we should have said this up front probably yeah. yes disclaimer yes I am not a licensed tax, legal, or accounting advisor. This is for informational purposes only. Anything we say or discuss here should not be considered legal advice. They should always reach out to a licensed professional before entering into any financial transaction. Yes. Pretty important to know. Um, 
but you've got some specialized knowledge here, right? Yeah, Sometimes yeah. we think the experts know it all, the ones that were educated at Harvard and know these Ivy League schools, and they go out and they pass the bar and they've been practicing for 20 years as an attorney, but mm -hmm. they're maybe not paying attention to this sort of thing. Or the average CPA has their blinders on and they're just worrying about tax season and this isn't yeah. on their radar. Mm -hmm. Well, our attorneys do. And like I said, because they specialize in it. They've been doing it since the 1950s. And so, um, you know, it's, I, I want to tell you that as someone who has a trust and has, you know, run a business with the trust, it's easier than me running my escort. Mm -hmm. And you can literally run it exactly the same way that you do your business now. The only difference is just that you're running, you're managing as a trustee, not as a president or as a managing partner. Right. But but at ultimately at the end of the day, it's the same thing. You trust pays, you know, pays salaries, it pays takes withholding, it, you know, whatever, however you run your business now is how you're going to run it inside the trust. You know, there's just a little few little differences, but nothing major. And right. uh, but the nice thing is is that you know, imagine you know, I've got lights surrounding me here, you know, because that's what you do when you're when you're on a podcast and you've got this big ring light in front of you, right? That's what's happening. We're going to be under this spotlight and we're going to have people over our shoulders peering to see what we're doing and so forth and removing yourself from that environment away from this where you have your anonymity and your privacy is going to make the difference between whether, you know, you're in danger of having your accounts frozen just like that or facing or facing draconian $500 day daily fines you know that could run up to tens of tens to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars wow yeah it's frightening mm -hmm. this this is a horror story I, yeah i wish we could have done this right before halloween um <laughs> so it would fit perfectly right. but you've been talking about this for a long time now right yes yes so so how long have you been preparing for this and educating yourself about this this in, impending most of problem? most of this year yeah i didn't really start speaking out about it until september mm -hmm. uh, because i wanted to make sure that i you know was trained and knew everything about it as much as i could i mean uh but i i've gone through every line of that um, of that uh, that law of that of the the FinCEN's you know PDFs and so on and so forth, and you know it's not just me. The attorneys have as well. I mean, I've been to I've been uh, two or three major trainings on from them about what's happening. So this is what I'm telling you is not just me saying, "Hey, I'm this genius that knows this stuff." I'm getting this from me from licensed attorneys who specialize in this, and this right. is what they're saying. Wow. Yeah. Well, Don, you've given you've given us a lot to 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 chew on to think about. Um, I appreciate you sharing all that insight into what's going on because it's a lot of the out of box thinking and and some of it does sound like doomsday type stuff, but we have to be prepared for the worst. So yes. if we go into it thinking it's all going to be a, a okay and then it ends up not being that and we're unprepared, then we're not being responsible. Um, for yeah. our, our own businesses and the people that work for us, right? Um, our, our families. Yes. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. Um, where can people find more information about this and about you and and how you could potentially help them? Well, I would say that the best way to reach me is at my email. It's very simple, uh, and I like to you know. I don't like it when people send me to landing pages and capture pages and so forth. You know what? Just I'm a very down home person. Just send me an email. And my email is spelled D O H N because my name is not D O N, it's D O H N at W L as in Larry, P as in Paul, W L P trust.com. Don right. at W L P trust.com, name spelled D O H N. Just send me an email. And uh, we'll, I'll send you information. I do have webinars every Thursday, not Thanksgiving, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, every Thursday night at seven o'clock, I do a webinar and we go over all this stuff and we ask, we have a lot of Q&A. So I'm doing my best and try to get as much reach as I can. You can also find, you know, look me up on social media. I post about this two or three times a day, videos, short little videos on, on right. what, what I do. So, I, you know, you can certainly find me. Awesome. 
Yes. Dawn, thank you so much for all the information and the insight. And um, maybe we'll touch base again in 2024 to see how things are going. I'm Love sure you'll have some updates at that point. Yes. Uh, but thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Bye. That's a wrap on today's Real Estate Revelations. Thank you for tuning into the REI Hacker Podcast. Remember, every property has a story and every deal is a lesson. Until next time, keep hacking the real estate world.